Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Looks like we have a good, uh, good uh, turnout today, uh, which is always encouraging. Uh, so today's uh, speaker is uh, Omer Arstein, who uh, who is a PhD student uh, working with uh, Dan Kodacek, and today he's going to discuss some of his uh, uh, recent work on uh, uh, clustering and controls. So, thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction. So. In general, my research interest includes clustering algorithms, their geometric and topological characterization and application to robotics. And today I will try to introduce uh, some application, potential application of clustering for robot motion design and control. So I think many of the people in this room is aware about that uh, with the, uh, uh, aware about that the increasing uh, uh, involvement of robots in our daily life. For example, after uh, cleaning robots, we are now impatiently looking for some robotic systems to do our laundry, cook for us, clean our dishes. And in general, it was one of the main goals of robotics to increase life standards by providing efficient, uh, safe solutions. And regarding this, for example, recently there is a uh, significant work for safe transportation based on self-driving cars or fast delivery, package delivery using drones. Also the other applications, for example, having better patient care or increasing the mobility for those people suffering from some kind of disabilities. And also robotic system uh, provides us tools to explore some environments which are difficult to access, maybe after an earthquake or planetary exploration or undersea application. In all of those application setting, one of the common goal is can we design reliable, safe navigation algorithms to, do, to achieve the given task? And today I will follow this outline in my talk. I will first introduce the uh, my motivation, why I propose to use the clustering for robot motion design and planning. And then I will demonstrate two applications. First, for the multi-robot coordination, can we use hierarchical clustering to uh, have efficient algorithms for the coordinated robot de design. And then I will consider the single robot navigation in cluttered environment and uh, provide an application of power diagrams. They are the generalized Voronoi diagrams for uh, reactive robot navigation and conclude with future directions. So uh, there are two main approaches to tackle this uh, safe robot navigation problem. One is the configuration space planning. The other is the sampling based motion planning. Configuration space is the set of all possible uh, robot states. They are free of collisions and they satisfy robot uh, constraint like kinematic and dynamic constraint. And a representative of those uh, algorithms are uh, can be discrete planners, potential field functions, cell decomposition, and roadmaps. All of those algorithms require the explicit representation of the configuration space, which is generally difficult because it has complex uh, geometric shape. And because of that, they are only, uh, they are mostly limited to low dimensional configuration spaces. So you need to have less degrees of freedom in your robot. And other than potential field functions, they generally have some discrete components, like discretization of the environment for the discrete planner. So they strongly, most of the time, based on efficient graph search algorithms. What they deliver for us is some navigation paths these are the paths connecting the initial and final destination, but they may be not feasible really. So you will try to follow this as much as possible. And other possible output can be navigation trajectories. They will uh, be suitable for your dynamics and it's possible to design some control to follow those trajectories. Or it, the best thing is you can direct the output control policies. So it will give integrated solution for the trajectory planning and the control. And my research mostly lies in this domain. I want to consider, uh, uh, consider most on the feedback motion design. Alternatively, instead of investing lots of time on understanding the underlying space of configuration space, 
uh, sampling-based approaches just consider individual samples from the configuration space and some simple connectivity criteria. Because of these assumptions, they can be easily applied to high dimensions, but they mostly based on some computational tools. So they want to use, uh, want to, uh, they mostly rely on fast collision detectors, which are actually kind of a cheating, it's cheating, it's a black box. You assume that it's always there. And it's mostly based on efficient sampling algorithms. For example, sampling around, around narrow passages are a challenging task for these approaches, so you need some informative metrics. And at the output, they generally uh, give us uh, some navigation paths or trajectories, but never gave us some control policies because they don't know exact uh, representation of the configuration space. So in my perspective, there is a significant gap between these two approaches, how they model the configuration space. On one hand, we have the global explicit representation of the configuration space in terms of standard represent geometric shapes. On the other hand, we have individual samples and simple connectivity. But there is a significant gap. Can we fill this gap? And it seems to be the idea should be uh, looking for some subsets in configuration space and identifying their relations. And from that perspective, I believe that clustering provides some tools, automated tools, to discover coherent groups in configuration spaces. Also, they give tools, for example, uh, symbolic, symbolic abstraction relating to continuous configurations with the uh, space of clustering models, including clustering hierarchies or set partitions. And these objects come with also some other mathematical properties. And the other application can be, can we define the locality based on some unsupervised learning algorithm? And this can be a useful tool for collusion-free uh, neighborhood identification. And what I propose to use those clustering algorithms is the uh, model the organizational structure in configuration space. For example, there are some applications of clustering algorithms to cluster obstacles so that you can efficiently sample. Uh, also, the other ep uh, important uh, advantage can be uh, this relation between the symbolic representation, for example, the connectivity of tree space can be useful to reduce the complexity of high-level planning. And the other application setting can be, you know, we can use those clustering algorithms to identify safe neighborhoods. And based on some greedy algorithms, we can navigate in certain cluttered environments. So in the first part of my talk to demonstrate an application of clustering, I will consider the uh, coordinated robot navigation using clustering algorithm because it uh, comes from this observation. When you want to move from one spatial configuration to a distribution to another spatial uh, distribution, you not only changing metric properties, there are some structural changes. So we are changing from we are changing our grouping relations, and one way can be thought as you know those groupings can be have specific structures, so they can be related with hierarchies. Actually, what we are trying to do is to go from one configuration to another. At the high level, you need to solve the structural changes. And motivated with this observation, we will consider this coordinated robot navigation problem. So we have uh, n number of disks in uh, ambient Euclidean space with certain radius r. And we are looking, we assume the first order fully actuated robot dynamics here. It will uh, simplify many things. And we are looking for local <coughs> controllers, uh, global controllers, that will guarantee the collision-free navigation. It will be globally asymptotical around a, any given desired location. Actually, there is a little bit cheat. It's impossible in many cases. You can have almost uh, surely, uh, you can uh, steer almost every configuration in your uh, uh, space to the desired location. And we want to have this algorithm to be efficiently 
applied for any number of disks and the ambient space dimension. And uh, here I want to clarify one point, why not bounded workspaces? Because this problem is already known to be really hard. If I am gonna claim something to solve this problem in a uh, bounded space, I will be cheating. So, because we don't know actually when and how the configuration space is connected if you have workspace boundary. Also it is very known it's very well known that moving this in polygonal regions is an MP hard problem. And here is, for example, a configuration within a bounded space, and they are not connected. You cannot really navigate from this configuration to another one. So because of that, we currently assume an ambient space so that we can enlarge as much as possible. But in the future, we would like to also uh, consider what kind of uh, bounded spaces and the uh, uh, maybe populated with uh, obstacles can be handled using those ideas. So in our general framework we have for component, we will use hierarchical abstraction as a relation from continuous uh, configuration space to space of binary hierarchies. So it's here you are seeing an uh, animation of how we can relate and I will tell more about this in the following slide. And Hierarchical abstraction gives us a kind of a natural way to divide our problem. We can fix the structural model and try to preserve it and ask this question. Can I navigate between two configurations? They are structurally the same. And can we look for this problem? So hierarchical preserving navigation, it will be the low level com component of our planner. Then given such an ability, can I plan? So can I plan at the higher, higher level? So it means that can I navigate in three space so that it will give me information about what kind of structural changes I should do towards to my destination because destination will be abstractly represented by another clustering hierarchy. And the connection between these two layers will be through portals, hierarchical portals. These will, will be, these, this uh, set of configuration will be the geometric realization of this discrete transition in three space by our agents so that we will move through some configuration which supports more than one possible clustering structure. So all these components actually requires lots of discussion, but I will give some overview, some important remarks about each construction. and. Uh, I will continue with some numerical simulation in this part. So here are some no notation. In addition to configuration space, we will have the rooted binary trees over n leaves, and we will have top as a binary clustering hierarchy. As we, I mentioned before, hierarchical clustering will be a relation from the configuration space to binary trees. And to demonstrate an application of this idea, we will consider specifically bisecting Cambrian's clustering. It starts with the whole configuration and splits into two using K-means and follows the same idea for each subcluster and obtains a clustering hierarchy as shown in the animation. And we will define this, uh, the domain of those local controllers, uh, their hierarchical stratum. So uh, this is the set of all configurations. They share the same structural property. In this case, it will be the same hierarchy. And by definition, we know that hierarchical strata defines a cover of the configuration space because any configuration can be clustered with some clustering hierarchy. And it is in general difficult to visualize uh, this <coughs> hierarchical strata and the configuration space, but here I will give a quotient space for the three particles on a plane. So you can think about the first agent is located at the origin, the second one is on the horizontal line, one unit away, and the third agent can be any other place. And depending on the third agent location, you have different clustering structure. If the third agent is far away, for example, in red region, you only have one clustering hierarchy. But if it moves closer to the other uh, agents, you start to see other clustering models. For example, in white region, you can use any clustering hierarchy to model your configuration, and these will be some kind of transition points we will use later. 
So how we can use uh, some kind of uh, topological information, the structural information about <coughs> this uh, hierarchical strata, and we will look the homotopy type of those uh, st uh, local domains. And when we ask the, so homotopy equivalence means that if you have two sets, they are homotopy equivalence, it means that one can be continuously deformed into another, other. And uh, using this definition, you can tell something about the configuration space of n disks, n point particles actually in this case, uh, moving plane, and the associated, for example, uh, clustering uh, hierarchical stratum associated with the tau. And for n equals two, there is only one cluster hierarchy, so configuration space and the hierarchical stratum are the same, and uh, it's homotopically equivalent to a circle because you can think about the first agent located at a certain location, and the other one is ob orbiting around the uh, uh, first one. And when you have ter three agents, uh, the configuration space is going to have a homotopy type of a product of a circle with a figure eight. Uh, the circle is here, it's come from the rotation, and the figure eight actually, in a, uh, you can have the third agent located in other place than these two locations, so it has this homotopy type of figure eight. And when you want to go further, it is really complicated. There is a huge literature in uh, math uh, really looking uh, at this problem. But when we look at our, the domain of each uh, uh, hierarchical, the set of uh, hierarchical strata, when we look at the hierarchical stratum, we see that a nice pattern. When we have three agents, we still have the product of spheres. When we have uh, n agent, we will have the uh, product of n, n minus one circle. Actually, in general, in a d-dimensional space, you will always have the product of d d1 minus one-dimensional uh, spheres and n minus one of them. And the geometric interpretation is due to uh, this fact. For a binary tree with n leaves, there is n minus one complementary clusters. And between the complementary clusters, we have separating <coughs> hyperplanes. Those separating hyperplane normals are actually going to be associated with this homotopy result. And at the end, what we can conclude from this observation is if you want to navigate from one configuration to another one, they are supporting the same clustering, clustering structure, then you need to align separating hyperplanes. And based on this observation, we will consider this hierarchy preserving navigation. Here, the only difference is we just focus on a subset of the configuration space, which, sub, which is associated with a certain clustering hierarchy, and we want to preserve the uh, clustering hierarchy, and it will directly imply also collision-free navigation. And we will use uh, this uh, nice separation principle between the complementary cluster. We know that complementary configuration clusters are separated by hyperplanes. So here you see. And uh, using this observation, it's possible to design a vector field recursively. So I think this is the important observation here. Uh, you can try to solve for any given par partial configuration starting from the root. If they are sufficiently aligned, there is a measure of sufficient alignment. Then you can solve this problem, uh, the navigation problem, very easily just using an attractive field. If they are not sufficiently aligned, you need to solve this problem. So you can partition the problem into sub-problems based on the children cluster and solve both for each children cluster recursively. Then compose these results such that you will still preserve this separation criteria. And based on this construction, you will obtain a behavior like this. You will preserve the clustering hierarchy and you will be able to navigate between any configuration supporting the same clustering structure. <coughs> so after having those local controllers, the question is can we have control transition between different clustering models? And 
you can think this, this problem as you have a set of local controllers associated with clustering hierarchies, and you want to find some prepared or the adjacency graph between them. So we say that two local controllers prepare each other if their domain intersect. So based on this observation, you can co construct a prepares graph, and using this prepares graph and graph search algorithm, you can find a composition rule to move, for example, if you start from this uh, local controller and to go to ninth one, you can find a composition rule. It will uh, sequentially compose local controllers and will uh, steer your configuration from initial to target location. <coughs> but the problem is, first of all, hierarchical strata generally have complex geometric shapes. So this is in terms of geometry, not topology. So it becomes really difficult to obtain this adjacency graph. Also, it's impractical to have this graph because we know that the number of trees are growing super exponentially. So you cannot really store this uh, if you have maybe hundreds of robots in your memory. And alternatively, we look at some other uh, mathematical relation between directly between clustering models and we consider nearest neighborhood interchange moves. So it means that if you have a cluster, you can swap that cluster with its parent splint and obtain a different a new cluster here. And by uh, using these restructuring operation, you can have a graphical rep representation of the tree space where the nodes will be trees and the edges will be, uh, there will be edges between any pair of trees if one can be obtained from the other by using a single NNI move. And we show that if you just focus on the two uh, a pair of NNI adjacent hierarchies, they, their strata always have non-entity intersection. So our proof was based on direct, directly a construction of a portal map. So if you are given a configuration from one strata, you can map into the uh, intersection of their, uh, their hierarch hierarchical strata. And as a result, you can conclude that the NNI graph will be a computationally efficient subset of the prepared graph. Previous slide, um, how do you, what's, what's the way to show global stability? Because Here? Yeah. So actually it's, first of all, uh, it's based on the alignment. We show that uh, asymptotically you align the separating hyperplanes. And if you already have the sufficiently aligned cluster, you directly use a kind of a gradient field. So can you build a global function or something? something? Uh, first, so it will be a kind of a composition of two. So you need to apply LaSalle invariance to, theorem first to say that you will be under this set of sufficiently aligned configurations. And inside this, you already know that the only stable point is the destination. Yes. Uh, motivation for uh, preserving hierarchy of clustering when we are doing navigation. I mean, collision-free and stability is understandable, but why do you want to preserve? Preserve? I think it's coming from, if we go back this framework, we want to have the hierarchical abstraction as the some kind of a high-level symbolic representation. And we interpret this relation as a two-layer division, but it may be... There might be some other interpretation, of course, but here we uh, want to forget about the continuous domain because this is the standard approach in hybrid system if you have a symbolic representation. And here we have this symbolic representation, a cluster hierarchy. After that, we forget about the continuous properties. And to forget the continuous properties, you should be able to say something about can you navigate, for example, preserving navigation or something else? And we choose this, but there can be some other extensions possibly. So it is not a requirement. It is our choice to demonstrate this idea. Oh, because we can now talk about uh, uh, symbolic dynamics at the high level. Because we know that anything happens here can be realized in the continuous domain using portals. Oh, we will continue with that, with this uh, observation. So up to this point, we say that NNI graph will be a subset of the prepared graph. So it's an efficient computation, efficient construction of the prepared graph. But 
uh, does it solve all the problems? No, unfortunately, because there are some other computational issues with DNNI graph. First of all, again, binary trees are growing super exponentially. And computing geodesic like in this graph is MP hard. So we have this graph, but I'm not going to use this graph to uh, solve any kind of uh, uh, navigation in this space. I will use another nice property of the clustering hierarchies. We know, so let me define the clustering compatibility first. A pair of clusters are compatible if they are disjoint or one is a subset of the another. And we know that a clustering hierarchy is a collection of pairwise compatible clusters. I guess this is the main lesson we learn uh, from these uh, clustering structures. And based on this observation, we can design a top-down approach to resolve the cluster incompatibilities between your current cluster hierarchy and the destination. It can be done uh, reactively online, so each step can be computed in linear time with the number of leaves. And also the other nice thing is you are guaranteed that the number of transition will be quadratic at most, quadratic with the number of leaves. So although we find a nice relation between the prepares graph and the NNI graph, we are not going to solve the geodesic problem. We will use an alternative method because we are just interested in a kind of a transition sequence, which should be efficient. So in summary, I gave a general framework to solve this coordinated robot navigation problem, and I demonstrated a certain way of you know, implementing this idea for a choice of clustering algorithms and certain navigation algorithm in three space, but these are, you know, free variables. If you have any other desire to perform during those locomotion, those navigation, you can replace any component in this uh, general framework. Here are some simulations of the behavior for four collinear points, and let's notice the number of total uh, local controllers. It's the number of trees. So it's 15 for four agents, and we have for activated deployed local controllers. So they are deployed online on the fly. And if we have six collinear disks, we have around 1,000. We only use six of them online. If you have eight, you have 10 to 5 of such local controllers, but we only deploy nine in this case. And we know that it will be at most quadratic. And if you have 16, you have more than 10 to 15. So instead of, so this means that if you want to have the global information, you need to compute that much, but we just want to be satisfied with the local understanding of the configuration space and solve this problem. So in summary, uh, we propose a novel abstraction, a fresh perspective for ensemble task encoding and the control. Uh, in terms of hierarchical clustering, and we, sh pro uh, we propose a provably correct ge generalized framework for collision-free navigation of multi-agent systems, and we demonstrate a computationally efficient instance of this framework. So there are many freedom here, depending on the application, you can replace any component. So if you are okay with the first part, I will continue with the second part. Here I will focus on a single robot navigation in a cluttered environment, as shown in the figure, and I will use the generalized Voronoi diagrams for navigation. And the motivation is, uh, recently there is a significant interest in fast flying in forest-like uh, environments or running in those environments or uh, agile navigation in dense human craft. So we want to consider such a simple setting, and can we find some nice, provable, correct algorithm based on, again, some clustering uh, idea, and solve this problem on the fly, reactive, maybe based on just uh, some realistic sensor model. So we have convex workspace uh, populated with uh, spherical obstacles, and uh, we will have have F for the free space of the robot. So here is, for example, one certain, uh, one such environment. And we need some assumptions about the obstacle. They need to be separated in a certain way so that we can uh, circumnavigate. A robot will fit between any obstacle. 
and so on. Under this assumption, we ask this question, can we find for a first order fully actuated robot a control policy that will guarantee collision free navigation? It will be globally asymptotically stable around any point. Actually, again, here there is some cheating because it's topologically impossible. We will just want to move almost every configuration to any given destination. And it should be applicable any space dimension. And some existing solutions, for example, potential field functions, they use some attractive fields due to the, some goal and uh, some repulsive fields due to the obstacles, and they combine, for example, just division of those two fields. Uh, uh, and uh, they use the gradient of this uh, potential function to navigate. But the problem is local minima. If you have a narrow passage, it really becomes critical that the attractive field and the repulsive fields are canceling each other. And navigation functions are introduced as a solution to this local minima problem. So you have a nonlinear way of uh, composing attractive and the repulsive field, but the problem is the param parameter tuning and the global knowledge of the environment. So we ask, can we find an alternative solution, no parameter tuning and the local knowledge of the environment? And the answer comes from the clustering. Uh, we will use the generalized Voronoi diagrams. Here, uh, pow uh, power diagrams are uh, cell decomposition of the environment based on disk. So every point is assigned to the closest disk based on power distance. If you have just points, it will be the standard Voronoi diagram. And based on this standard uh, algorithm, we will define the wor local workspace and the local free space of the robot <coughs> as follows. We will consider the obstacles and the robot as the generator of the a power diagram of the workspace. And then we will pick the power cell associated with robot as the robot's local free space. And local, lo local workspace. And local free space is obtained just eroding workspace by the robot body size. And such a uh, cell decomposition enables us to check the collision free configurations reasonably effectively. So a configuration is uh, free of collisions if the robot body is included in the local work cell. And you can also conclude that uh, local free space of the robot is going to define a safe neighborhood. Any two configurations and the straight line joining them will be free of com collisions. So based on this observation, and the idea of chasing a carrot on a stick. So instead of trying to move our robot directly towards the destination, we want to cheat a little bit and say, gave a local target like a you know carrot. So our local free space will be a cage behaving like a stick, and we want to place our carrot in a way that uh, it will be related with the metric projection. So we want to take the closest point on this workspace to the destination and place our carrot there. And then let the robot follow this local goal in an online manner. And what kind of behaviors can we obtain? And it turns out to be we only have a unique dance attractor at the goal and one saddle associated with each obstacle. It's a topological necessity. <laughs> and the construction is piecewise smooth, collusion free. We don't need to tune any parameter here. Is it's uh, just arbitrary positive coefficient control gain. And it just requires the local knowledge of the environment. And why this algorithm is actually, this control law is working is it's related with the instability of the inverted pendulum. So balancing on a ball using a, a board is unstable under the gravitational effect. Here you can think about that the goal ha applies some kind of at attractive field like the gravity field. And you have some virtual balls between the robot and obstacle, but you cannot stabilize. And it's rollover and circumnavigate uh, the obstacle towards the target location. So it is very simple. I guess this was the simplest part of my work to present only one slide. So when we look at the behavior of our vector field, 
away from the goal, we see such motion patterns. Also, since we have a collision-free local workspace, it is easy to extend this uh, controller to the differential drive robots. There are some nanonomic constraints on the motion of the differential drive robot. And the nice thing is we see a significant consistency between the resulting trajectory and the boundary of those Voronoi cells. For example, roadmap methods just desire to have such a behavior, but they are just pl path planning algorithms, not the vector field. Here we achieve almost this goal using a feedback motion design. And this is a practical behavior because if you are flying at a certain speed, you want to balance your distance to close by obstacle while navigating to destination. So what do you need to know to compute this? You so you just need to know those obstacles who are defining the local workspace. So it is just, uh, actually it's uh, referred as the Voronoi adjacent obstacles or the Voronoi adjacent sensing. So in summary, we propose an application of generalized Voronoi diagrams for identifying a collision-free neighborhood of a robots and propose a provably co correct reactive motion planner to navigate in such cluttered environments. And I will conclude with the, some future directions. So we ask the question, can we solve the same problem just using some more realistic sensor model? It's positive, yeah, we can do it. Uh, and under certain conditions, for example, the result can be extended to convex obstacle as well. You don't need to only have spherical uh, obstacles in your workspace. The other interesting uh, connection is, can we combine our collision avoidance strategies with coverage control? And you can have some kind of interesting heuristic, for example, if there is an unassigned robot here, how you can steer it, just steer it towards you know safe region uh, encoded by this power cell, and it will try to be far away from the rest of the agents. And it seems to be a good heuristic for the congestion management and coverage control. And the other interesting extensions, there are lots of different clustering algorithms and configuration spaces for robot, for example, robot arm. It has totally different topology for the legged robot. And there are different clustering algorithms. Can we find other different, you know, applications where we can really take advantage of the clustering algorithm? Distributed clustering and the motion control is an important extension for multi-robot configurations because I believe that there can be a unifying framework where you can solve control communication and information aggregation all in one framework. So just using the hierarchical clustering base uh, uh, communication and control. And tracking and clustering can be used effectively maybe to detect some anomaly. And the most interesting one is the, how we can learn some control policies based on clustering. So this is one uh, perspective, one direction I really want to uh, further continue in my future after maybe finishing PhD, and empir empirical demonstration of those ideas in realistic settings will be interesting, I think. So I want to thank my collaborators, my advisor, Dan Koducek and Dan Gurolnik, and I also appreciate to be a member of the Code Lab, and we have funding from FSR. We thank their generous support, and if you have any other question, I will be happy to answer. Yes. So um, the thing that you need from the clustering method in, in particular is this uh, convex clusters. It is easy to analyze, but it is not a must. It is easy to analyze because you know that convexity almost accepted as a kind of a, having an analytical solution. So here we use this advantage to demonstrate some possible practical application in the short term. But I believe that there can be some other uh, interesting clustering methods because actually the main advantage of having the clustering structure is the, the information 
provided in terms of the topology of the strata. So here, it tells us something we don't know in general, but it locally tells something. And any clustering algorithm that provides such interesting, you know, simple topological information about the uh, subset of the configuration spaces. And if they are topologically non-trivial, I believe that they have some kind of also some symbolic relation. It can be used to effectively simplify high-level planning. For example, in here, we just propose a, a linear time algorithm to navigate in three space. It was due to this fact because our abstraction is it doesn't have a trivial topology. In general, there are some algorithms, for example, convex cell decomposition methods, but they really forget about the all topological information because we know from the NERV theorem that all the topological complexity of planning is moved to the carry to the higher level planning. And in this domain, you have the graph representation, and mostly people believe in the computation power, but I think mathematics can provide more if you want to investigate sometime. But in this case, that, that particular commodore is the space uh, of the, uh, you know, the cross product of the spheres. Uh, that is for the particular class of uh, the clustering? Yeah, actually, the, here it was due to this linear, separ linear separability of the clusters, so it was the, due to convexity. Yes. But I believe that there can be some other Yeah, I, it's the interesting question, actually. It is the interesting research question. Can we come up with other, you know, nice observations regarding clustering methods? Because it's also the problem that in data mining, people doesn't pay that much attention about the topological properties. But here I have a reason to care because I want to have a little more understanding about the configuration spaces. Maybe not complete information, but just local information. It's at the end of the day, it provides me an efficient algorithm to solve my problem, which is MP hard, you know, in general. So I guess this was the main observation. Yes, please. So, I mean, the role of convexity in the, the bodies of the objects moving and the obstacles was guaranteeing that you have this functional be result. So the convexity is actually due to the property of the k-means clustering. So these separating hyperplanes are defined by the centroid of each, you know, complementary clusters. And when you are moving, actually, you are trying to make sure that, yes, I will freely, for example, at this level, I will freely design some control law for the left children and the freely for the right children without really worrying about this separation condition. But at the end, it is free to push away. So we combine these two construction in a way that the resulting field always guarantee that the complementary clusters still will be linearly separable. Yes, please. So here you have, a, uh, you have a simple uh, choice model where you can actually however you want, right? Yes, you, I can set the velocity here, you can see. Um, because otherwise it becomes... So if you change the dynamics, if you have more complicated dynamics, what will that affect? What so... The it is related with, again, finding some proper Lyapunov function. For example, if you have differential drive robots, most likely it will be, again, still will be easy to extend this result because you have the convexity as in the second setting. For example, for single agent, it was really easy to extend for us just using off-the-shelf differential derived control. Just instead of having a, a static target location, it was changing in a kind of a, you know, time varying fashion. Here, you can also have a similar thing, I believe. But when you think other uh, non-alonomically constrained dynamics, I believe it's a little bit difficult. So because of that, there is, you know, two trends. One is sampling-based algorithms. For example, it's easy to generate some navigation trajectories for any dynamical model, actually. But the problem, you have this sensitivity to noise, replanning issues, and so on. But yeah, it's an interesting question to ask up to which level you can 
have you know extension to other dynamical models, maybe second order systems. It's much more interesting, I think. One more question, more about the second part. So it looks like you have a you have a good algorithm for very cluttered spaces, right? So you have a very let's say very constrained. Actually, I believe that this is, so the other work is currently work and processes will show that uh, you can navigate in such spherical environment using any greedy algorithm. So it is not that complicated. People are spending too much time trying to solve this problem. I'm just providing a solution, which is, you know, when we think about the existing literature, it resolves some limitations, but I believe that it was the wrong approach because they insist on having some attractive and repulsive field because it's intuitively very easy to understand or combine, implement. It is very easy, but this was the not, not right approach. It was the cheating to you know save the day, but at the end, the ex, for example, he, here we really try to capture the uh, mathematical properties as much as possible. And it turns out to be a simple algorithm here. A simple role, control law, just solve this navigation problem, any, pro, any you know, undesired local minima and so on. My question is, you, know, you have a less cluttered space. OK, less cluttered sounds like easier. Sounds like easier. I don't know, what yeah. Would you, what would be the interesting? So any cases to visit, you could do to add extra things. I don't know things like that. Uh, you want to do shortest path. Oh, so e it. so it's a good observation. We never guarantee the shortest path or anything, because I also against this uh, consistency, you know, trend in finding the optimal thing. Because what is the optimal from the natural perspective? So some people like this behavior because you balance the distance, the obstacle, while navigating the destination. You don't need to because shortest path will always, you know, say that follow the boundary, which is in practice actually very uh, critical for a robotic platform because there are lots of noise. It's easy to hit some part of your body, especially if these are some human, for example. So it's an interesting research direction, but in general it seems to be I won't have such a desire to have optimal navigation trajectories, and I don't guarantee any optimality. But yeah, in less cluttered environment, maybe you can say something about you know how well you are doing with respect to a short spot. Yes. Well, I mean, just also regarding what HG says, for short spot you need like local information, right? You're relying here on local information. That is true, right? Actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it is possible to have. The shortest path in sphere were just using the local information because this is sphere. But if you think about you know extension to general convex shape, maybe it won't be possible just using the local information. But I believe that it's because I spent some time and it seems to be the spherical environments are significantly simple. You can almost do if you want. If this is the desire, most likely I believe that. I Greedy algorithm like bug algorithm may give you the shortest path in these environments. But I don't know how critical such a result. Because people are complaining about following the boundary. Yeah. But, but in principle, finding the shortest, I mean, you're, you're telling me something that, that I don't know, that, you know, nobody but you know, right? But in principle, you, you need to have the global knowledge of the environment to do the shortest. I believe that in spherical words, local information almost. I didn't verify, but currently, for example, I am working on you know what kind of environment you can navigate just using some you know local information and some greedy navigation strategy, and it turns out to be spherical words are the only ones you can navigate. If you have any convex shape like this, you need to have at least some kind of memory. It can be, you know, in bugs al bug algorithms, the direction, the commitment to a certain direction to follow. For example, if you follow to want to follow the boundary on the right direction, you need to commit that 
choice. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee the convergence if you make the decision. So, okay. Now the the, the, the question that I really have is like a, here where you are where you are moving the tarot. <coughs> where in the where in the set are you putting the tarot? The green mm -hmm. right? So carrot is gonna be the. So let me start. So in this cell. We are selecting the closest point to the destination. So it is our carrot location. I didn't so visually put here because it's a cheating. Actually, this is the workspace, not the free space. So because of that, I didn't include in the visualization, not to mislead, because actually the metric projection is done on the free space, mm -hmm. local okay. free space. But let me see if I understand this. I mean, you, 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 have, a, you have a polygon, right? Or yes. A polygon or a convex so environment like around. This, using this bisector. Mm -hmm. And then you decide to navigate towards a given in that polygon that is closest to the destination. Yes. So it should be, if the goal is not included in this cell, it should be on the boundary. Mm -hmm. And we also know that metric projections on the convex cells are functions. So we know that there is no multiple solution to this optimization problem. So they have nice properties. And also, depending on the boundary properties, if you have the differentiable boundaries, in this case, it's piecewise smooth. So you have the piece some kind of a differentiable to properties almost everywhere, except those you know, uh, corner points. Here to, to obtain this kind of behavior, you have to have the exact um, information about where your obstacles are relative to your current position. Is that correct? Yes, currently I assume the exact sensing. There is no noise. But most likely, you know, it can be easily extended. And this environment is uh, very, you know, user friendly because of this instability. Although you may have lots of noise in your sensing, most likely you will, in average, you know, guarantee in, pro in probability that you will move around the obstacle. It cannot keep you forever. Yes, please. Is there any advantage to uh, consider uh, trees that are not binary for clustering, for example, if more, some, some of them are together? Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of an interesting question. We consider binary trees because there is a question, for example, when you are applying k means, what is k, right? What should be the optimal value? So you need to invest lots of time to find the optimal k. So we say that we don't need it. We just want to find a split because we just want to have some kind of topological information. We are not doing anything optimal here. But it's a good question. You can make further investment on the, uh, you know, optimal partitions. And it turns out to be you have a similar topologi pr topological characterization. Actually, it will be a product of similar simple shapes. So there is uh, one work by Yuli Barishnikov and my collaborator, you know, Dan Guralnik on this. So they consider a different clustering method, and they look exactly that form of clustering. So you need to have different restructuring operations. Actually, this NNI restructuring rules can be extended because it's, you know, you are just cutting a subtree and merging at a certain location. So let me, here. You are cutting B and A, and you are merging A with C and B as a parent spleen. And there can be different way of cutting and pasting them. Actually, there are subtree, prune, and regraph like restructuring operations. But they come up with lots of other alternative choices. And planning in that graph seems to be more complicated. So I didn't gain any more information. Although this is a really restrictive operation, restructuring operation, it's easy to you know plan something because it's uh, 
it gives you just such a cycle. There is not that much possible movement, and you can easily understand the math behind this. But yeah, there are lots of other restructuring operations that can be applied both for binary trees and other degenerate trees as well. So is there any other question? Thank you very much.